Welcome to episode 65 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes. Now, before we get going, a little word of explanation. Some of you might be a little bit confused. You've perhaps seen that there's a new episode of the podcast available, but you can't find it. That's because for the first week, the podcasts are now just available on YouTube. So if you go to the Cycling Europe YouTube channel, you'll find them there for the first week. After the first week, they're available in all the usual places, Amazon, Google, Apple, etc. Now, to episode number 65, lighthouses. They make great starting and end points to cycle routes. But in this episode, I'm talking to somebody who's decided to go and visit every single lighthouse in mainland Britain. I started by asking him to introduce himself. My name is Matthew Sturgeon. I'm an architect by trade. That's my day job. What I love doing is, other than architecture, is riding bikes and exploring places. So I have a blog called projectlighthouse.blog, and that is set up to work with the ride I'm doing, which is the coast of mainland Britain and visiting all 186, I've now found out, lighthouses along the mainland coast. I'm doing it for a charity, a bit of a break that provides holidays for people with terminal illness, raising money for them, using the lighthouses as a method of of monetizing it as well. So people do sponsor me 25 pence per lighthouse visited. So I've got a, a number of people who do that. And every sort of 25 lighthouses, I ask for my money and they kindly drop it on my Just Giving site, which is also Project Lighthouse. We'll talk about all that in more detail in a second, but... Could you go back and uh, tell us about your history as a cyclist? Have you always been a cyclist? Yeah, always, always, always loved it. Mountain biking, road biking, people always try and, I think people try and pimp, you know, oh, what sort of cycling do you, I do it all. I just love being on the bike, really. Um, I used to do a lot of rock climbing uh, and I wasn't very good at it. And I've and since found out why I used to do it, which was, it was a, a reason for being out in the countryside and going to incredible places. Um, and I see my bike the same thing, really. The cycling and the, it is a wonderful thing, but it is, it is what it gives you that I love, the idea that, you know, it can take you places, you can see an awful lot, you can travel amazing distances quite easily, really. And, uh, yeah, so always, always loved cycling, always loved it. So before this project, had you, had you ventured... Um, abroad or around the world or anywhere like that? Yeah, well, um, not massively. Uh, we, I've, we cycled once with my late wife, Angela. We did um, Pisa to Rome on the bikes. I've been mountain biking abroad to Slovenia and, and other places. And then I've done quite a bit in this country. Uh, cycled the Donegal coast. Um, I've cycled from Ilkley from home to Pembrokeshire coast. I was part of Angela's bike ride which was from her my parents house which is in Bath up to her parents house which was in Liverpool so and then with the kids we did in fact I was watching your your video the other day of the Outer Hebrides and we did a similar journey with the kids when they were younger we went from the bottom end all the way up to we didn't do Lewis we got to Harris and then got stuck on a beautiful beach couldn't really leave it so we didn't go any further <laughs> So we've done that, and we did the Inner Hebrides with the kids as well when they were young, camping and travelling across in, under our own steam. I love travelling under my own steam, you know. It's way better than a car. So you mentioned your wife there, and she is obviously instrumental in what you're doing now. Can you just give the background as to um, what happened with your wife and uh, what that led to? Yeah, we very active individual who loved cycling, loved the outdoors, everything else, very fit, capable, lovely person who sadly in 2011 was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. It didn't stop her doing anything really at all. Quite the opposite. I think it kind of inspired her to say, well, I've got this, you know, this thing, but I'm just going to carry on and do what I want to do. So she, you know, we did a lot of bike riding, some of the things I mentioned, the Donegal Coast and 
the ride from Bath to Liverpool were done as charitable things as well. She raised for target ovarian cancer, just short, I think, of £40,000 on that ride. And then we did the Donegal ride, which was her last ride. And then she passed away sort of six months after that ride, um, which is quite amazing, really. And that was in 2016. But before that, she set up a bit of a break, which was what we what she realised with her illness and with others was that you never know when you've got spare time. Lots of people don't have a kind of financially strapped because of their diagnosis. So she wanted to set up this charity that that basically we found people who had holiday homes and said every year, you know, I'm sure you must have times when it just doesn't get filled. And they go, yeah, we do. It happens. So, so, and then we go, well, can we have that time? The, the bits, the unfilled time in your properties, can we have them? We'll pay for the, the cleaning of it. We'll pay for the administration of it and things like that. And we will find people who are in our situation who, who would love a holiday, who would love to get away, to talk about their issues, to talk, you know, or just to get away from hospital wards and everything else. And just, uh, so it's worked really well because the property's the last minute. And so, and people's lives are kind of a bit like that as well. You know, when you don't know when you're going to be fit and healthy or well. So, you know, we find slots and then we have a, a list of people who we can ring up and say, would you like to go to Labour Street this weekend? Or would you like to go to the Northumbrian coast this weekend? And we send people away. And that's what a bit of a break charity does. Uh, and it's been really successful. I thought when I when I read about it, I thought it was a really innovative idea. I'd never heard of that kind of thing being done before. And it makes sense, doesn't it? All these properties, for a lot of the time, as you say, they lie empty. And it's just a quite a clever, basically minimal cost option for them to be made available to people who are in that situation. Indeed, yeah, yeah, it's worked, it's worked really well. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I seem, I'm the kind of may, the main kind of financial you know, support in terms of what I'm doing with Project Lighthouse and other things that I've done. Uh, I did a ride. We went to the Outer Hebrides eleven years ago and bought a cask of whiskey. So this year, it actually because it was eleven years because of COVID, and um, this year it, it matured. And we cycled back onto Isla to pick up our whiskey and brought it home again. And then I sold my share. I had 32 bottles and I sold my share for a bit of a break and for another charity that Angela was part of, which is called Hospice Africa. So I made 4,000 quid out of a whole lot of um, bottles of whiskey uh, after dragging it off Isla on our bicycles on trailers, which was no mean feat. <laughs> Jane and I, it was, it was hard work. <laughs> Probably a story there in itself. It was brilliant. There was about, I think there was eight of us who did that. It was a great, a great few days. So the idea of doing the ride involving the lighthouses and visiting the uh, lighthouses of mainland Britain, was that an idea that Angela had discussed with you or was it something that you thought of after she died? It was after she died. We'd, um, we'd already done with Angela the home to my parents, home to Liverpool, and then the Donegal ride. So that was kind of a thing we we did together, really. So this was kind of a continuation of what we'd done before as a couple, really. And then my partner now, Jane, she works for the Environment Agency, and I had had this idea in my head. And somebody who she works with sets up cycle rides, and uh, she said, oh, do you want to join us? We're going to do from Newcastle up the coast to Edinburgh. And that was the first ride. And I thought, oh, my God, if I'm doing that, I've got to start doing this idea that I've got in my head. of I can't ride all of that coast and not visit the lighthouse and tick them off. So that became the start of the journey. The other people on the ride, there was about, I don't know, 15 of us on that ride. Nobody knew what I was doing. They kept on going, where's he gone? He's disappeared again. And I would shoot off to St. Ab's Lighthouse and get a photograph and jump back on the bike and meet up with them again. I was knackered by the end of it. <laughs> so what are, the, what are the rules that you've kind of set yourself? You mentioned that there are 185 or 186. Yeah. An MP from Clanelli, Clanethley in South Wales, uh, since that article came out, said, love what you're doing, but you've missed off one of our lighthouses. 
off the map. <laughs> so I've had to add that one on. I did notice that on your website it says 185, but on the BBC article from last week it does say 186. So it is 186. It is 186 now, yeah. I, but when I started doing this, I thought there was 170. So the more I ride, the more lighthouses seem to appear. Uh, the rules thing, generally, what how I'm classifying the lighthouse, because that's difficult in itself, because you get beacons and lightships and lighthouses and all sorts of things. My simple classification, if it's a lighthouse on the Ordnance Survey map, it's a lighthouse. It's as simple as that, really, because some of them are a bit tenuous. Is there no definitive list that Trinity House of... No, I don't think there is. No? And Trinity House are a funny thing because they have their own lighthouses. They're protective of their... They don't, they're not responsible for all the lighthouses. I'd hazard a guess at 50%. So there are lighthouses that are not part of Trinity House. Are you including lighthouses that are no longer lighthouses that have now been, you know, appeared on Grand Designs and are now somebody's luxury apartment on the coast? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Working ones and not. Lee Scar in um, off the coast of sort of uh, Cumbria, and it's just a metal frame. There's nothing left other than the metal frame, you know. But uh, it's twenty five pence a lighthouse. I'm make, I'm making sure they count. What's the attraction of the lighthouse? Why why don't you go and visit Weatherspoons or <laughs> yeah, there's a thought or whatever? What what's the attraction of a, a lighthouse? Well, I love I love ex, sort of the extreme places. I love going and cycling out to the ends of the earth and things like that, you know. And the extreme places are can be incredibly beautiful places, like Ardna Merkham Point, which we cycled out to, which is just amazing, stunning, beautiful place looking over all the inner Hebrides in Scotland. Or it can be behind Haitian nuclear power station, which has its own interest, should I say. You know, uh, It just takes you to incredible places. And I'm so, so often I find I'm just taken aback with it. I just think, oh, my God, we've got to do this ride because we've got to join up the whole picture. I'm not really looking forward to it. And yet I'm yet to be anything other than blown away by every single ride we've done. It, it, it's, the coastline of Great Britain is incredible. So so lighthouses just connect everything up for me, really. And there's all the symbolism of it, isn't there, of kind of safety and, and hope and all of those things that tie in really well with it. You know, and I, as, as an identity for a ride, it's a strong identity, I think. You know, people latch onto it. I've got a guy who wants to do... Um, a blog with me from all of this as well. It's mad. And he he's from the United States Lighthouse Society. He's got in contact with me. How did that happen? So, so the whole lighthouse thing, I think people do have a connection with them. Yeah. Lighthouses are really iconic things, aren't they? And it's on a few of my rides, I've just been delighted. I've perhaps known about them in advance. For example, you know, arriving in uh, Brindisi, where there was one, arriving in Cape St. Vincent in Portugal. Again, beautiful lighthouse. And again, you mentioned the Outer Hebrides, getting to that northernmost point of the Outer Hebrides. There's something really satisfying about getting to a lighthouse to finish or indeed start your journey. It's like a, a, a pole in the ground. You know, you go and touch it and you think, wow, no, that's, that's it. I've finished that ride. I couldn't agree more, absolutely. It kind of adds to the whole story and the whole feel of the ride, doesn't it? I think they are incredibly special places. More and more they're getting disused, really, because of GPS and everything else. But they're still beautiful structures. Yeah, we need to cherish. Is there a connection, do you think, with your job as an architect? Yeah, I guess I guess there is a connection there, isn't there? Absolutely. And I am fascinated by the designs of them. You know, you just think all lighthouses are sort of circular in plan and have red and white stripes i mean if you go on my blog you'll just see it, the amount of designs are incredible uh, smeaton who was the engineer stroke architect for quite a lot of them he's he was from leeds as well so you know that's local to me but but yes some some of them uh the one on it's called herd groin which is one of my favorites which is on the newcastle on tyne on the south south shields on the estuary and it's like some sort of spacecraft it's incredible we got there in the dark and had to light it up with our bike lights to get a to get a good photograph it, it's a really exceptional bright red 
steel structure. Um, so yeah, all of that, all of that adds to it for me. Yeah, I'm just scrolling through the pictures because every time you visit a lighthouse, you take a picture and you and you put it on your blog, which is projectlighthouse.blog, and you'd think that over the centuries they would have come up with a definitive design for the the lighthouse, but every single one of them has got its own unique design, its own unique features. The only thing that they've got in common is basically that they've got a lamp at the top. Yes. Yes, and I have to park. One of one of you asking, you know, what are kind of rules? I park my bike next to each one. So my blue bike, which um, sparkly blue bike, I call it, always gets parked up. Not me. They don't want to see me. And the bike goes next to it. So that's my kind of tag to to prove that I've been there. You know, there've been quite a few people in recent years who have set off from one point on the coast and basically cycled all the way around. I think probably the most famous person to do it would be Mike Carter when he wrote his book, One Man and His Bike. But you're doing it slightly differently. You're doing it in bits. Were you ever tempted to take three, six months off work and just go around the coast and visit everyone in a sequence? It's fascinating, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. But this isn't a lone journey of somebody shutting his front door and, and heading off. And that did cross my mind. But life gets in the way of things like that. And there's other influences and, and everything else. But what, what I also do is I, I invite people to come on these rides with me. So every ride before I do it, I've got a, a list of people who've asked, oh, could I be part of this? And I email them and I post on Instagram what the next ride will be and when it is. And sometimes it's just Jane and I. Jane does all the rides with me as a little team. We've had up to 20. We're doing the Lynn Peninsula. I think we're going to have, partly because of what's happened with the BBC, I think we're going to have like 35, 40 people doing that ride. So I, I collect people. It sounds weird when I say this. I collect people as well as lighthouses. It, I love new people coming along and doing it. We don't go fast. You know, it's all about seeing stuff and chatting and being in the moment, all of that kind of stuff. Much more than, you know, whether I can beat some sort of tra Strava segment or something like that. Not interested. Logistically, what happens? Do you, presumably you don't cycle from Ilkley to that point on the coast. You, I don't know, you get in the car or go on the train? That's the bit I struggle with, really, because I, I think, oh, my God, I, to do this, I'm going to do so much driving. If you look at the map on the blog... Most of the ones that can be reached in a couple of hours, we've kind of done now. Um, but our circumstances as a couple and a, as a family has changed. That the, the children are now all away pretty much at um, uni or uh, jobs. As we do more in Scotland and go down to Cornwall, we'll take longer. We will take a week or two weeks off to complete those ones. So I'm looking at the map now. This is on your website. Now you've got all the lighthouses on there, some are in blue, some are in white. The blue ones are the ones you've done already? Yeah, there's sort of light coming out from the coast. So there's like a light grey and a dark grey sea around the map. Yeah. And that is the is the coast that I've, I've done so far. And the dark grey is the coast and the lighthouses still to be done. You've done the majority of the ones in England, apart from the west of England. Uh, you haven't done many in Scotland yet. Yeah, I'm up into Scotland in June to do around Point of Store and Ullapool and all of that area. That's that's the next one. Some friends said, oh, would you like to come on holiday to Loch Inver, which is where there's an amazing mountain, Sylvan, there. We want So it's suddenly like, right, we're going there for a bit. We'll do that piece of coast. So that's kind of how it's working. You know, we kind of get influenced by others sometimes of where we go and what we do. Why did you... I'm just looking again at the map. If I look at Liverpool, there are two lighthouses there that you haven't been to, but you've been to all the others in Liverpool. What happened there? Uh, <laughs> well, there's, well, there's there's the Mersey. There's We've got to go around the Mersey and pick up um, some lighthouses there. That I haven't done that ride yet. That is one I think we'll do before June. Uh, so when we did the Wirral, which is on the south side of the Mersey, that was one of the big rides. I think that was 20-odd people on that, and it was like herding cats. 
and we run out of time. So the one one of the ones we've missed there is so I've got to go back and do a, like a, a five mile bike ride. But I have family over there, so I can easily go and visit people and jump on the bike and connect it in. But that's the most inland lighthouse in Great Britain. It's called Bidston Hill, and it's up on top of a hill. And we were cycling around the coast, and I thought there is no way we're gonna <laughs> gonna have time. It was, uh, I think it was like, I think it was on Boxing Day or something. It was, uh, so we didn't have much light as it was. So, so yes, you're right. Well spotted. We've got a couple to do there still. And because your rule is that you're cycling to the mainland ones, there are a few pretty iconic ones that you're going to miss. For example, the one in Anglesey at Hollyhead. And also I'm looking at um, the Isle of Wight, the Needles. You won't visit those. Were you not tempted just to include a couple of offshore islands as well? Well, this is when you come back around to like my, I can make the rules up, you see. So so I've done, there's one on Walney Island, which is in Cumbria, which is an island, not mainland. But at low tide, you can walk across to it. So that's one of my rules. If you can get to it by foot, I'm counting it as mainland. And then the other ones, I'd love to do it. I think what will probably happen is when we finish the mainland, we'll then start doing the Isle of Skye, for instance, which is amazing. And and yeah, I have circumnavigated Anglesey. I've done that ride before. That was a super two day. We did a two day ride around Anglesey. That was fantastic. So I think that's that's going to be phase two. Now these are presumably multi day rides. So what do you do in terms of accommodation? Do you do you take a tent with you? Are you in B and Bs? Yeah, a lot of them have been. A lot of them, we we did the Norfolk coast, that was a sort of a four-day ride, and we stayed in pubs and b and uh, In the summer, we did we did sort of Kent coast and into the Thames estuary, and then up to, oh gosh, up into Suffolk, really, all of that area. That time we camped, we do a bit of bikepacking and put the tent on, camp for a couple of nights, and then, and then maybe stay in a hotel somewhere and and get freshened up and then go again really so it's a mixture really um and we love all we love all of that i i love the sort of bike packing side of it all and when we go up to scotland there'll be i think we'll be plenty more of that really you mentioned actually your favorite can you remind us what was your favorite lighthouse so far adna merkin's a classic one on the the most westerly point of mainland britain more westerly than land's end which sounds a bit bizarre but and then her groin, which sits on the on the Tyne, the mouth of the Tyne. At the other end of the spectrum, which were the most disappointing? <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know really. I can't find. I don't think I find any of them. Just they're all. I mean, some of them are just simple. There was the I think it's called Lee Scar, which was just basically a, a steel frame in the sea, and you know. We'd had to cycle down the lane and then drag our bikes over sand dunes to look at a piece of metal stuck out in the in, just off. The sea was in, so you couldn't even get to it. It's like, okay, there it is. Some of them we can't get that close to. Some of them are in ferry terminals or they're on MOD land and things like that. So I've got a long lens on my camera <laughs> to try and try and suck them in closer. But I mean, that happens very rarely, actually. Most of them, I would think 98% of them you can you can walk right up to. I was going to ask you, do you always make an effort to try and get inside the lighthouse? But the other thing is what you've just mentioned. Are you not tempted to write to the MOD or whoever owns the land and say, hey, I'm doing this project? Yes, I have done. And what do they say? Yeah, I have done and had no response from them whatsoever. <laughs> no, I have had I have done that a couple of times, but I haven't had the only one I've had, the only one I've had to um, I've knocked on the door Great Orm Lighthouse, which is incredible. Um, land near Landudno is just an amazing spot. You go around the Great Orm; it's worth a cycle ride any day of the week. And um, that's uh, it's part of a house. It's like a B and B business. I had to knock on the door there and. I was taken round the back. It's not a lighthouse, which is a tower. It's almost like a conservatory stuck on the back of the building, really. It's a curious thing. And uh, uh, when I got round there, it was full of a party of ladies who had a weekend away and were clearly well and too oiled on the, on the white wine. So <laughs> I, I became their entertainment for half an hour while I stuck my bike next to it in photo. What are you doing? And it's like, you know, 
Oh dear, it was it was a lot of fun actually. But that was the only that's the only one I've had to ask permission for it so far. Ask permission and been granted it. And have you actually stayed in any of them overnight? Oh no, I haven't. I haven't. I've been up quite a few of them. Yeah, as you say, I think have you been in them? Yes, I've been in a few. I, and I am very tempted to. I'd love to go back to the Great Ormond and, and do that. I think some of the ones in Scotland are quite remote. Some of them and have accommodation. I was thinking, and that would be fantastic just to um, use that as our overnight stop. I'm sure there was another report on the BBC website recently, only in the last couple of weeks, where it was about somebody who'd renovated one, and she she rents it out now as a, a B&B or whatever. So I don't know if you've been to that one. No, I haven't. Well, I don't, I don't know the story, so um, I'll, have to, I'll check that out. Yeah. See whether it's still on the list. I've been past a few... Um, that you know have signs up saying B and B, and it's like, oh, there's a there's a missed opportunity. So I must do that. I must do that. We have to stay. In. What's been the most difficult one to get to? Um, so far, the Arden American one was quite a story because one of the rules is we're not just visiting the lighthouses; we have to do all the coastline behind it. So I had a run of five rides where we didn't even visit a single lighthouse; we were just covering the ground between the lighthouses. So sometimes I'll, I'll put these out and then people are going, where, you know, they join us and go, where's the lighthouse, Matthew? And I said, there isn't one. <laughs> and they're a bit horrified. What? It just doesn't happen to be one on this coast. The Arden Merkin one, we started our bike ride three miles away from the, the lighthouse and then cycled in a clockwise direction around the peninsula. And in Scotland, it's different to England. The OS maps show tracks in Scotland they don't really define them of what they are, really. So we followed this track, which was just horrendous. So we were carrying our bikes over the coastline and dropping down the other side. I think we did 76 miles that day to get to a lighthouse that where we started three miles away from it, and it took us 76 miles walking bikes over hills and everything else to come all the way around to get to the lighthouse. So we'd, so we'd completed that whole peninsula, essentially. And then we had a three-mile journey back to the little house we were staying at and only to find that the river was in spate and we couldn't cross it and we had to then do another 12 miles detour to get back to our accommodation. Um, so I think that was could have been the easiest one because we were only three miles away from it, but it turned out to be a big day. How many of the rides have you actually done then? It sounds like you've done quite a few. What, rides in total? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I think we've done about 60, 60 rides so far, 60 bike rides. I visited 100 lighthouses. Last week we did, again, a ride round uh, the South Humber to Cleethorpes. And because it was the 100th ride, lots of people go, oh, I'll come on that. And I'm thinking, oh, no, please don't. It's just going to be a bit grim, really. And it was fantastic. <laughs> the weather was incredible. The Humber was still, it was like a a mill pond, the light, that sort of winter's, that cold blue winter light that you get. Hull looked incredible across the Humber. Uh, the Humber Bridge was sort of appearing out of clouds. It was a really fantastic day. We had such fun with fish and chips on Cleethorpe's Pier at the end of, of the day as well. So what's not to like? You've got a little bit of uh, coastline just to the south of, well, it's the east coast of Yes, Lincolnshire, yeah. presumably, yeah. that you haven't that you haven't done. I'm guessing that's probably not going to be very exciting. Well, yeah, I know. Well, there is there's a very famous seal sanctuary there, so we'll go and visit that. There's no lighthouses on it. That's the last bit. Once I've done that, I'll have done all the coastline from Southampton all the way around the east coast of England, all the way up to to Edinburgh. So that's quite a nice little piece, and we'll hope to do that soon. You, we talk about. You know, I invite lots of people and then I go, right, how the hell am I going to get them from one end to the other? <laughs> you know, um, it's all right doing a one-way cycle. but it's, uh, And so much of the coast of Britain is actually connect, well connected with trains, actually. Um, so we use trains a lot and pile more bikes on than the conductor can deal with. But that one doesn't have trains, so we're going to have to do some sort of shuttle to try and make that work. So that's a tricky one. No lighthouses, although there are these... The other thing that I, there's a really interesting thing called time and tide bells, which are um, an art installation that's been put in lots of all the way around Great Britain, where it's a bell that sits within the water. And when the, 
the tide rises, it rings. Um, so I'm also interested in, 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 in spotting all of these time and tide bells as I go. So, and there is one, there is one on that ride. So um, I'll, we'll use that and we'll do that instead of a lighthouse for that. And for the ones that are remaining, do you have a schedule for 2023? Do you have a list of, of uh, rides? Not as yet. I mean, we've got the Scotland, we've got a Scotland trip in June. We've got the Lynn Peninsula ride. That's a two day ride. And we're, we're camping on the cliff tops near Aberdaran. They, they have teepees. It looks fantastic, this campsite. They have teepees. So I've booked three teepees. So that can, that's 18 people dealt with. So they just need to bring a sleeping bag and crash there. People pay me to do the ride as well. I don't ask for them. I ask for fiber, but most people give me more. So, you know, I've become a bit of a tour guide, essentially, for people and, and sort, sort all the logistics out, which I enjoy doing. So that's another way of monetizing it, really, I guess, you know. When you, when you say you get paid, obviously that, that's the money that goes to the charity, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's not, I don't get a pen. It cost me. It cost me a fortune, to be honest. But there we go. <laughs> and if if somebody was thinking of doing a similar kind of thing in the future, what advice would you give them? What to do, uh, doing this? Um, or rather, if you were to do it again, if you were to go back two, three years to start the whole thing again, what would you do? It would you do it in a different way? Would you do it more organised, or do you quite like the haphazard nature of the whole thing? I love the happen. I don't know. I don't think I do anything different because it's just grown. It's just sort of grown organically and beautifully, really. You know, I did when when I started. I thought, oh, this will take me two years. I think I'm on year four or five now, and um, hopefully it'll speed up a bit now. There was some gaps because of COVID and personal stuff. All of that got in the way. It's the inclusivity of it that's that's the real joy. That you know, we we can get people along and. And get people riding. Some people who never ride, you know, we get people who come along on electric bikes and all comers is, you know, and we'll go, the speed we go at is the comfortable speed of the slowest person. That's fine. Not a problem. So I don't know whether I'd do anything different. Would I have started it if I'd have known how long it was going to take me? Probably not. But, um, well, I don't know. I probably would have, really. I'm determined to complete it. That's for sure. It builds with momentum, really. Do you know yet which of the remaining lighthouses is going to be lighthouse number 186? <laughs> yeah, we've talked about this. Um, so there's two things, really. Um, the last lighthouse I would like to be Cape Wrath in the very north. You know, and that is a, an exceptional you know, finish at the top of Scotland um, along a dirt track and then clearly camp the night there and take some whiskey with us it would be the appropriate thing to do i think the last ride will be to angela's parents house because they live in crosby which is north of liverpool on the coast so there's a bit there on the map that's not um the, there's no lighthouse there but that will that will most definitely be the last leg of the journey to complete the loop around great britain so we'll finish it at my late wife's parents' house. And if you do do the Cape Wrath one, then there's the, and you cycle along that road up to Cape Wrath, you'll then be uh, eligible for the Cape Wrath Fellowship, won't you? Which is uh, a Cycling UK thing. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to work out how I can get from Cape Wrath and then down to Kinloch Brevi. There's an incredible beach called Sand, Sandwood Bay just south of Cape Wrath. But it, it will be hiking over heather with bicycles, I think. Um, but I, I think we'll do it. I think we'll just take our time. The other issue with Cape Wrath that you've got to contend with, apart from going on that road, is the fact that it's all military land, isn't it, up there in that corner? Yeah, we've got to make sure the ferry's running because you've got to get across, um, is it Durness Estuary or something? Um, and yeah, it is. So it's a bit of a timing thing. I, I think the access is pretty good, but... Yeah, there are times when it'll be it'll be closed. I think. What next after having done all 186 lighthouses? Is there something else? I don't know. Perhaps those perhaps those Weatherspoons pubs. <laughs> well, my partner's uh, my partner really loves um, Jane. Really loves sort of uh, the Scandinavian countries, or you know, uh, and and below uh, Germany um, up to 
Holland and she and then um, Denmark. Uh, so there is there's a there's a route. It's the North Sea. You know all this, I'm sure. The North Sea. Yeah, the North Sea cycle route. Correct. So we'll have done the by by default by what we're doing. We'll have done all the sort of leg down England. So so then we might just jump across the channel on a ferry and then start heading up and completing that. I think I'd love to do that. But once upon a time, there used to be a ferry that went from um, Newcastle to Stavanger and Bergen, and uh, it's it's a crime that that got closed because that was such a brilliant ferry to put you in the heart of Scandinavia. Well, there is talk of that ferry being reinstated, I think. Is there? The North Sea Cycle Route is Eurovela 12, I think it is. And I did actually cycle a little bit of that in last summer when I went from the Hook of Holland down in the direction of uh, France. Uh, so there are definitely there are definitely a few lighthouses down there. So you can you can tick those off when you get there. Um, what do you think your late wife Angela? What do you think she would think of what you've done over the last <laughs> five years? Uh, I think she'd be gutted she wasn't on it with me really or with us. In you know, um, uh, she. Uh, yeah, no, I mean it's just what she did. It's it's just a continuation of what she 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 would love all of this. Yeah, and and you know we're supporting her charity that she set up, and uh, you know her it's her that's the inspiration. Lots of her fa- she's from quite a big um, Liverpool um, family, and they're all up for doing stuff. So you know when we do the Lim Peninsula, lots of Angela's brothers and sister will will be with us. Her dad is going to join in some in some shape or form, you know. So it all adds to kind of a memory of her and 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 keeping keeping things alive in in a, in a different way. <laughs> yeah. So just to finish with, um, could you remind anybody listening of how they find out more about the project and also how they can contribute financially to the charity? Yeah, so I have a Just Giving page, which is which. If you just put in Project Lighthouse, you'll find that on the Just Giving site. That's easily done. Um, I have an Instagram uh, account called Sparkly Blue Bike, which is my bike that comes with me, and I put next to each and every lighthouse, um, which records all the lighthouses I go to, um, and I I put up the rides on there if people want to do them. And I have a blog called projectlighthouse.blog. Um, and on there is an email address if you want to be put on a list to come on a bike ride with me, uh, wherever you are in the country. It would be fantastic. Um, as I say, we had this, um, I missed one of the lighthouses off the map, which was um, in South Wales. And the, the local MP emailed me to say, you've missed my lighthouse. But let me know when you come in and we'll give you a, a, a great wel- welcome in Clanethley. So that we're really looking forward to. That's the sort of thing that really makes what I'm doing tick, really. So, so yeah, yeah. please join in. Please sponsor me on um, Just Giving Project Lighthouse or just have a look through the blog. You're an architect. Have you ever been tempted to build one? <laughs> I um, So I think I mentioned earlier before that Smeaton, um, the engineer, was from Leeds and uh, there's an arts company called We Are Fox Club, and um, a Leeds-based one, and they want to put a memorial up to Smeaton, and they want to put a lighthouse up in the centre of Leeds. There's a on the River Air. There's an island within on the river in the city centre, and um, so I have I have been I've had discussions with them. I don't think I'm the chosen architect to do it, sadly, but um, it would it would be a lot of fun to put a lighthouse up in the in the centre of Leeds. Yeah, that'd be great. It would, and you'd be the you'd be the perfect person to do it. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think so. They don't think think so. <laughs> They're lovely people. It's brilliant. And it's a great it's a great idea. Okay, well um I think it's fascinating what you've done. I you know I I it, there's something always nice about when you get to a lighthouse and you just kind of it, it gives you an excuse to stop and stare and take a photograph and just contemplate life. And I think what you're doing is brilliant. I think it's a a unique idea, 
and uh, obviously in a fantastic cause. So good luck with the rest of the uh, cycles, and hopefully people will continue to contribute to the the good cause and the charity. Contribute in any which way, you know, riding with me or throwing me a few quid, all of that. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. It's been really good. And thank you to Matthew for agreeing to take part in this episode of the podcast. I'm seriously thinking of joining him in May, I think it's May 20th, 21st, when he's going to be doing a section of the Welsh coast. So perhaps that might be featured in a future podcast. Who knows? Talking of future podcasts, the next one should be, hopefully, about Brittany. I've already spoken to a chap called Tim, Tim Bowden, about his travels around Brittany in the summer of 2022. And then the podcast after that, well... The week after next, in the middle of February, I'm heading off down to Tenerife and I'm hoping to record an episode of the podcast all about cycling in and around Tenerife. So look out for that in a few weeks' time. If you'd like to get in contact with the podcast, then you can go to cyclingeurope.org forward slash contact and find all the contact details. Perhaps you've got your own cycling story that you'd like to tell. And if you'd like to help support the podcast, then you can go to cyclingeurope.org forward slash support and you'll find all the details as to how you could do that. And for those people who have in the past supported the podcast, it is very much appreciated. There are costs involved and it just helps make the whole thing a bit more sustainable. So thank you for listening. Thank you to Matthew for contributing. And I'll be back with episode 66 of the Cycling Europe podcast very soon. So thank you for listening and happy cycling.